Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Medi Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, today we have a really timely topic, uh, inequities in uh, well-being in medicine. Uh, it's timely because we're all under a great deal of stress and we've been uh, fatigued by the prolonged uh, uh, COVID pandemic and um, and uh, the increased responsibilities that all of us are facing clinically and in terms of keeping our academic uh, work moving forward. So uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce two speakers to you, Amira Delpino Jones and Elizabeth Harry, who will be giving uh, Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, Amira um, is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine. Uh, Dr. Delpino Jones is the Director of Diversity and Development in the Division of Hospital Medicine and also serves as the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs. Uh, Dr. Delpino Jones received her bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado in Boulder and her MD degree from the University of Colorado. She also did her health staff training here and then was uh, quickly brought on staff in uh, hospital medicine and uh, rose through the ranks and now is an associate professor of medicine. She's focused her career on interprofessional uh, clinical care and training and also improved efficiency of hospital care, focusing on diversity and also on readmissions. Dr. Elizabeth Harry is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine and senior director of clinical affairs at the University of Colorado Hospital. Uh, Dr. Harry received her bachelor's degree from Santa Clara University and her medical degree from the University of Colorado. Uh, she did her house staff training here at the University of Colorado and then went to uh, Harvard where she was a Macy scholar focusing on um, skills in uh, medical education. Uh, she has focused her career in understanding and improving care delivery in the inpatient set setting, focusing specifically on system redesign, cognitive load, as well as provider fatigue and provider burnout. So we have two experts that are gonna give us uh, quite a bit of insight in terms of understanding inequities in well-being and medicine. Uh, Dr. Harry, I think, is going to uh, kick off uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, medicine grand round. So, Dr. Harry, welcome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, well, we're so excited to chat with you all today. We have sort of a lot that we want to cover. Um, and so I'm just going to start by going through what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start at a high level, what is well-being? What is the goal? Um, what is burnout? <clears throat> and what are some of the impacts of burnout, both on our patients as well as ourselves? What is the national data around this? So um, across the medical education continuum, how does well-being affect learners as well as faculty? And what is the, co the impact of the COVID pandemic been on well-being? Uh, we'll then briefly touch on how our faculty are doing um, and then what we're doing both at the School of Medicine and then at UC Health for both learners and faculty uh, to address this. So just so that we're all on the same page, what is the goal and what are we trying to shoot for? Um, so engagement, um, there is actually a definition and it's, it's a positive state um, characterized by vigor, dedication and absorption. It's, it's the provider you want to see your family member. It's the person who is um, curious and then has the energy to ask the questions and is engaged and is present with you in the room. We all know what it feels like to be around those providers. We all know what it feels like to be those providers. Uh, and we know what it feels like to, to not be around those providers or not be those providers ourselves. Um, and so the antithesis of that is burnout. And, and this is a continuum. This is something that people go through being in states of high engagement and then being in states of burnout. This isn't sort of a dichotomous thing that you are either a provider that is this way or you are a provider that is this way, but there's sort of a continuum over the stage of our career. The definition of burnout actually has three components, um, two of which are measured when we measure it. So emotional exhaustion and depersonalization are the two pieces that we measure. And then the third is lack of sense of personal accomplishment. Emotional exhaustion is that sense that you're just completely tapped out. You have nothing left to give. Um, and the key here is that that doesn't recover over time. So if you take a weekend off, you don't feel repleted. And depersonalization, I think, is one of the more dangerous components. And that's that sort of cynicism and callousness that develops. 
I always think it's amazing. I, over the course of my career, I've had the opportunity to read a lot of people's application essays. And they always say these incredible things about how much they love patients and how much they want to engage with patients. And contrasting that to some of the stories, sometimes you overhear either in the ele elevator or in the hallways <clears throat> that we shouldn't be overhearing, but that are clearly demonstrating a sense of depersonalization of our patients. And, and I think we're at risk of that the more overloaded we are. And then lack of sense of personal accomplishment is this idea that no matter what I do, it's not going to make a difference. That patient's going to come back in with heart failure next week. There's nothing I can do that will actually contribute meaningfully to this. Um, and so just to sort of step back and think about, well, why is this important? So even prior to COVID, looking at the rate of burnout, um, the Harvard School of Public Health and the Mass Medical Society in January of 2019 actually called physician burnout a public health crisis. And they called it that because it was at alarming levels and they felt that it threatened to undermine the patient-doctor relationship and the delivery of healthcare nationwide. They said that EHR burden and regulatory burden were the main causes. And of course, this was pre-COVID. <clears throat> and they recommended that institutions appoint a senior executive, have rapid access to safe mental health care, and have advocacy regarding EHR usability, which we've had a lot of here with um, the work around the EPIC sprints. And then also at the sort of policy level, trying to modify what the requirements are around documentation. And then in October of 2019, the National Academy of Medicine uh, uh, published um, one of their consensus study reports on well-being. And Mark Moss, one of our pulmonary, the head of our division of pulmonary, was actually an editor of this um, piece. And it, it basically went through the data on how many folks are burnt out. So as, men, as many as half of the country's doctors, and again, this was pre-COVID, and nurses are experiencing burnout, and trainees, it's higher, as high as 60%. And there's increased risk to patients, increased malpractice claims, increased absenteeism and turnover, and we'll talk about that, and loss of billions of dollars to the medical industry each year as a result of this. <clears throat> so they identified this as a systemic problem that required systemic solutions, um, and they had several call to actions as well. So they recommended that healthcare organizations create executive level positions um, to monitor and protect clinician well-beings and develop IT programs to reduce repetitive and redundant paperwork, um, that we should train learners how to deal with this, um, that we need to work with medical licensures to make sure people feel safe to seek the care that they need to get. And we're going to talk a lot about that throughout this talk, and that's a common theme. And that federal officials need to have a coordinated research agenda to understand why this is happening and, and how we can impact it so that it doesn't negatively impact our patients. And I think one of the key things is, and I, I meditate regularly, I find it very helpful, but that this isn't something that we just tell individuals, you need to do these health promoting behaviors, such as meditation, yoga, and self-care, and you'll be fine. But that there's really a systemic driver of this and that we need to take accountability for that as institutions um, that are responsible for how people deliver care. So when we think about what the impact of burnout is, um, there's been a lot of nice studies to, to evaluate this. Um, but one by Lottie Derby and several of her colleagues, Colin West and Tate Chanifel, looked at the impact of patient care. So there's um, double the risk of medical error. A couple studies have come out recently going back and forth on that. Um, increased risk of odds of being named in a malpractice suit. Um, increased risk of substance abuse or self-medication. A doubled risk of suicide ideation. And interestingly, suicide rate among male physicians is 40% higher than other males. And I want this just to sink in for a second. For female physicians, it's 130% higher than females in the general population. Um, it also has a huge impact on workforce and system cost. So there's a huge decrease in productivity and job satisfaction with more than a doubled self-reported intent to leave if someone's experiencing burnout. And we'll talk a little bit about some of our retention data. Um, and, and with every one point increase in that emotional exhaustion scale or one point decrease in job satisfaction, there was either a 28 or 67% greater likelihood of reduction in perfection, uh, professional effort. And I think it's really important to think about what does that mean if someone reduces their clinical hours? Um, it becomes very expensive overall in the healthcare system um, because you're still paying benefits for people, but you're losing that clinical revenue. And then you have to you know, um, bring in a new provider that you're also paying benefits for and, and it gets very expensive that way. So the effective result in loss of productivity annually is estimated to be the loss of seven graduating classes of medical school every year uh, due to the loss of productivity, which I think is pretty powerful. So again, the goal is not just to not be burnt out. And I think that's important because, oops, can you guys still see my screen? Let's see. Um, I think that piece is important that the goal is, is not just 
not to be burnt out, but that we actually want to be able to experience professional fulfillment. Um, and so this has actually been defined as the ability to um, experience happiness, a sense of meaningfulness and self-worth and self-efficacy and satisfaction at work. Um, professional fulfillment is promoted by professional autonomy. So the sense that you have a sense of control and that you have a sense of meaning and purpose in what you do. Um, and it can actually be measured by the Stanford Professional Fulfillment Index, which is a 16 item tool that's been validated and is free uh, to nonprofit institutions. So any of you can use it in your research for free. Um, and it is professional fulfillment is actually inversely correlated with work exhaustion, disengagement and medical error, as would be expected, I think. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Delpino Jones uh, to hear about burnout in learners. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So medical school is conceivably one of the most stressful times in a physician's life. And it's not surprising that medical students experience high levels of psychological distress as well as mental illness. As you can see here, 40 to 79% of medical students experience a high level anxiety, and that's compared to 14% of the general population. Two to 35% of medical students experience depression, and that's compared to 7.8% of the general population. In addition, depression amongst medical students is more prevalent than among demographically comparable groups and higher than among students pursuing other graduate degrees. Uh, this wide range of percentages that we're seeing here likely represents um, the differences in the year of uh, their education. So basically, as students progress throughout medical school from year one to year four, we tend to see um, an increase in psychological distress as well as other um, different mental illnesses as well. As Dr. Harry had mentioned, decreased well-being can contribute to things such as academic dishonesty. And when we think about this in medical students, it may be reporting a lab is pending and they don't know if the lab is even ordered or reporting a physical exam is normal, even if they didn't perform the physical exam, um, can also contribute to substance abuse, increased cynicism and decreased compassion. Right, next slide. And there are a number of factors that may contribute to medical student distress. And this include things such as personal life events, curricular factors, which we'll talk a little bit more about, family or personal history of depression, demographics, including gender, marital status, and parenting, personality, and stress. So in general, students with more social support and active coping style, a strong sense of personal control and high cognitive ability self-esteem are in some ways more successful at warding off poor mental health and or accessing the resources necessary to combat it. All right, next slide. There have been a number of studies that have actually looked at the impact of race, ethnicity, and gender on medical student distress. This particular study looked at the mental well being in first year medical students and uh, made a comparison by race and gender. They found no significant racial or ethnic differences with respect to self rated health. However, they did find that African American students were more likely to report symptoms of depression and anxiety when compared to their counterparts or their colleagues. And women were more likely to report symptoms of depression and anxiety when compared to men. I think it's important to mention as well that there has been similar studies done for first year medical students looking at um, students who identify as LGBTQ plus as well. And um, those who identified as LGBTQ plus were also more likely to report symptoms of depression and anxiety and were more likely to, re um, to report that their, their health was um, not as good compared to others. Right. Next slide. So when we do start to talk about things such as race and gender, I think it's important to um, add in another factor that may contribute to medical student distress, and that's stereotype threat. And stereotype threat is a phenomenon in which fear of fulfilling negative stereotypes about one's groups impairs performance. Next slide. So in this particular study, um, we actually had um, students who had completed their core clerkships um, complete a survey um, to try to determine their vulnerability to stereotype threat. So um, this study was actually done um, here at the University of Colorado in collaboration with um, the University of California, San Francisco. And collectively, we found that 28% of students had high vulnerability to stereotype threat. 
Of those 28%, 82% were Black, 50, 45% Asian, 43% Latinx, and 4% White. Um, of those who were identified as having high vulnerability to stereotype threat, about 18 students um, volunteered to participate in interviews. And it was through those interviews and through those stories um, that we were able to determine that stereotype threat is a three-stage process, um, as outlined in this diagram on the slide, that's triggered when students experience the workplace through the lens of race and ethnicity by standing out, reliving past experiences, and witnessing microaggressions. So I like to frame it as, you know, if you're a student on rounds and you've just experienced a microaggression, you're probably thinking about a lot of things in that moment. You're thinking, did that person mean to say what they said? Am I interpret interpreting what they said correctly? Um, should I have said something? Is anybody else on my team going to say something? And while you're having this internal dialogue, your team may be talking about, say, the pathophysiology of heart failure, and you're not really going to hear any of that. The issue is you're going to be evaluated on, do you know the pathophysiology of heart failure and how to treat these patients? So overall, this may affect your evaluations as well as your, your scores. And, you know, we've seen this phenomenon at the undergraduate level as well. Um, women in undergraduate education, particular the, particularly with those in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM majors, are more likely to experience stereotype effect, uh, which has been linked to poor self-esteem poor self -esteem and poor mental health. Um, so this would suggest that there are certain groups of students who are more likely to enter medical school or be at a greater risk for poor mental health. Next slide. So this study looked at the, once again, the impact of race, ethnicity, and medical stu student well-being in the United States. And they had over 3,000 medical stu students at five medical schools complete surveys um, using these validated instruments to better assess burnout, depression, and quality of life. Um, students were also asked about the impact of race and ethnicity on their training experiences. So they specifically asked, has your race adversely affected your medical school experience? And this was a basically fill in the answer and give some examples. Uh, next slide. The response rate was 55% and nearly half of students reported burnout and depressive symptoms. Mental quality of life scores were lower among students than among the age match general population. And prevalence of depressive symptoms was similar regardless of minority status. Interestingly, more non-minority students had burnout. However, while minorities appeared to be at a lower risk for burnout than non-minority students, race did contribute to the distress minority students experienced. So essentially, minority students who experienced um, or perceived that their race had adversely affected their medical school experience were more likely than minority students who had reported no such experiences to have high emotional exhaustion, high depersonalization scores and to meet criteria for burnout. These minority students were also more likely to screen positive for depression and to have lower mental quality of life scores. Next slide. So here is a number of representative quotes um, from the students who had um, filled out the survey and filled out the question regarding um, how their minority status may have impacted um, their experiences. And as you can see here, there are a number of things that came up, including racial discrimination, racial prejudice, isolation, and cultural differences. Um, and some students felt that um, their race may have impacted their evaluations and their grades. Um, there may have been questions about um, you know, why they were uh, able to get into medical school. Again, this feeling of isolation and sometimes tokenism. And then um, how uh, different cultures um, cultural differences may impact how they are viewed and evaluated on the rotations in terms of verbal communication and nonverbal communication as well. Next slide. So um, they've actually looked at the temporal trends in bur medical st school burnout. And I did mention that um, in general, as we, we see the progression from the first year to the fourth year of medical school, we do see higher rates of anxiety than depression. But in this particular study, they actually surveyed um, students nine times during their medical school to, um, career, once at, um, starting at the beginning um, of their medical school, so at orientation, and then after they had matched into a residency. 
And as you can see here, um, emotional exhaustion tend to peak after the first year and after the third year of medical school. Next slide. And likewise, depersonalization also increased throughout the four years of medical school and also increased after our peak, should I say, after the first year and third year of medical school. Next slide. Lastly, in this particular study, they went beyond looking at just um, medical students, um, but actually looking at burnout amongst residents and early career physicians in the general US population. So they had over 26,000 medical students complete these surveys and over 20,000 residents and fellows in all different specialty fields. The medical student residents and physician surveys included the MBI, um, which contains the three subscales sub of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and sense of personal accomplishment. They assessed for suicidal ideation by asking all respondents during the past 12 months, have you had thoughts of taking your own life? And they also asked all respondents to rate their overall mental, physical, and emotional quality of life over the past week um, using standardized scales. Next slide. So when measured with the full MBI, burnout and high depersonalization were highest during residency and lowest during the early career stage. Symptoms of depression and suicidal ideation were more prevalent during medical school and were less prevalent during residency in the early career stage. So as you can see here, about over 9% of medical students had um, said that they had suicidal ideation in the last, last 12 months. And um, you should keep this number in mind as we move on to talk more about the faculty. They did see that being a resident or a fellow, an early career physician, male and married, remained independently associated with lower odds of having symptoms of depression. Next slide. <clears throat> and medical students were also more likely to exhibit higher levels of fatigue, um, whereas more uh, medical students reported slightly better overall quality of life. They did report slightly worse physical and emotional quality of life, but those differences were uh, much smaller. Next slide. Um, so we did talk about where we see the inflection points for depersonalization um, and emotional exhaustion for both for the medical students. And this chart here talks about the stage specific stressors that may correspond with that, including human dissection and first death experience. With residents, we tend to see um, increased burnout as a result of the added responsibility of patient care, maybe related to research productivity, their job search and overall lack of control as well. Stressors for both medical students and residents at all stages can include things such as adjustment, competition, high stake assessments and lack of personal time. And lear learning and work environment factors associated with burnout can just include a poor learning environment overall, work compression, um, limited autonomy. And the one thing that we definitely pay attention to is mistreatment. This is something that is um, you know, part of the national surveys for our, all of our medical students. So interestingly, the things that we had seen, at least according to the studies, um, that are not driving burnout um, include for our first and second, first and second year students, um, hours spent in lectures and small groups, hours of clinical experiences, hours and number of exams and weeks of vacation and well-being. For our third and fourth year students, um, there's no in independent relationship between clinical rotation characteristics and workload and burnout. Um, this I found very interesting because sometimes it's a little different from what we may be hearing from our students. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what impact COVID has had on the inequalities in well being. And I just want to do a huge shout out um, and thank you to Dr. Epperson, Dr. Rangensteiner, and Dr. Um, Andrew Rivera. Um, we're partnering on, on writing a paper together, and a lot of this data was jointly collected by them. So I just want to thank that. Um, them for helping do the literature review on this. Um, so if we think about specifically inequalities when it comes to STEM, um, it's important, a study that was done um, in 2020 found that women in minority groups in STEM were already disadvantaged compared to their ma uh, male counterparts. They were more likely to be early in their career, um, less likely to be higher paid, have a lower salary regardless of their rank, be a single parent or primary caregiver and have experienced discrimination in the workplace. And so I think it's just important to note that, you know, they were starting from a place that they were um, a little bit more disadvantaged. And then we'll talk about how there's been um, disparities and how COVID has impacted people. Um, and then that, that may 
uh, sort of advance or exaggerate that disparity. And I think it's really important to note that this doesn't seem to be improving despite a lot of attention to it. So this is um, a paper that actually came out uh, about a week ago from the New England Journal. Um, and they did a study of US medical school graduates um, from 1979 to 2013, and they, and they pulled this data in 2018. Um, and they found that women were less likely than men to be promoted from assistant to associate professor and from associate to full and less likely to be appointed department chair. Um, and they did Kappelmeyer curves of both of these and found that the sex differences have not diminished in any way over time. So this is a 35 year study that was just published um, demonstrating that there's really been no uh, narrowing of this gap. And, and like I alluded to earlier, um, there seems to be a, a bit of a widening of the gap because there's a disproportionate impact on some of our vulnerable populations um, during COVID. So frontline workers, 75% of all frontline workers are actually women, um, putting them at greater overall risk to be infected. Um, STEM mothers have a particularly vulnerable time right now, um, part due to prenatal care, delivery and infant needs, um, presenting financial challenges and stress during a time that there may be additional financial uh, challenges and stress, and then the concern over getting infected during pregnancy, uh, where to deliver and medical services um, to be available and safe in that time. And then regarding academic um, women in STEM, the pandemic has led to a decrease in the papers published by women, as well as fewer citation of women authored publications. Um, and I know Dr. Schwartz in a previous I think Grand Rounds or maybe Town Hall had said that we had looked at this for our department and, and not seen that, which I think is something that we should be really proud of because this is something that's definitely been seen nationally. Um, and then what other impacts um, are there on our URIM faculty and women in STEM due to COVID-19? So there's been several studies looking at this and specifically around depression and anxiety, just in general, uh, the general US population is having a threefold higher rate of depression and anxiety during the pandemic. So I think that's important to acknowledge. And then being a frontline healthcare worker and female was associated with the greatest risk for both anxiety and depression than before the pandemic. Trainees who are exposed to COVID are, are reporting significantly higher stress and more likely to be burnt out. Um, and a survey that was uh, done between uh, in June of 2020 indicated um, that 10% of respondents um, reported considering suicide, which is up from 4% in, in a prior uh, survey that was done. Um, and healthcare providers, along with police officers, are at higher risk of suicide compared to the general population, which we talked about earlier. And then in terms of trauma exposure and post-traumatic stress symptoms, um, so men are actually more often exposed to traumatic events. Um, the lifetime prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder is 10% in females and 5% in males, despite the fact that men are more often um, exposed to traumatic events. And they were looking at this in China, um, specifically looking at post-traumatic uh, symptom scores um, using the post-traumatic and I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. Looks like you can. Okay. Um, using the post-traumatic uh, symptom score measure and what, and as well as the sleep quality index. And what they found was that female sex was associated with greater PTSS, with females experiencing higher degree of re-experiencing their symptoms, um, having alteration in cognition or mood and hyper arousal compared to men. There's been some hy hypothesis that uh, neurohormonal access might um, uh, Play into this. Um, and then sleep quality, um, has, there's also disparity in this. So we all know that insomnia is a symptom as well as a predictor of onset and exacerbation of many mental health disorders. Um, and sleep disturbance is associated with a greater risk of suicide with those experiencing mental illness at the time. Um, what I think is really interesting is that per the perceived stress of racism is associated with worse self-reported sleep quality and increased autonomic activity during sleeping, so less restorative sleep. Um, and so during sleep, um, heart rate variability should go up, which measures parasympathetic tone. Um, and in, in um, a study that was done measuring uh, heart rate variability between black and white um, patients, they found that those who identified as black had lower heart rate variability during sleep than those who identified as white, which um, would indicate lower parasympathetic tone during sleep. And so I just want to share this video. She was, she was fierce and she was brilliant and caring for patients and having compassion for people was her, 
being. Jennifer Feist is the sister of Dr. Lorna Breen, who oversaw the emergency room at New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital. She said it was like Armageddon. She said, there are so many sick people everywhere. She said people are just dying in the waiting room before they even get in. On Today, Jennifer and her husband, Corey, told Savannah, Dr. Breen got sick with coronavirus and just days later went back to work. I kept telling my sister, you know, you can't, if you can't function, you can't help anybody. You have to sleep. Sensing she was in trouble, her family and friends got her to a hospital. But after being released, she took her own life. For somebody whose life's calling is helping people, and she just couldn't help enough people, and the combination was just untenable. I cried the whole way home. Arlene Van Dyke is a critical care. And so I'm, I'm going to pause it there. It moves on to another story. But I actually um, got to see her brother and sister who were presenting there presented another um, talk as well. And they actually shared that part of what drove Lorna's thought process behind this that she shared with her family was she was so concerned about the stigma associated with mental health issues and that it would ruin her career um, if she sought help. And they actually thought, oh, that's crazy. That can't be true. And um, after they lost her to suicide, they actually started looking into the state laws and found, as many of us know, that that, that, that is true and that there are a lot of states, we are not included in this, that have licensure um, language that makes it very challenging to seek mental health care. Um, and so I, I think it's important to know that we have vulnerable um, populations and, and, and that, you know, this is an issue that's coming up. And one option that we have is sort of using a common language or a mental model of how to identify where we are in terms of the stress continuum. And so this has been adapted from um, the Navy stress continuum by Laura McGladry, who's one of our faculty, um, looking at, you know, our, where are people on the scale from ready to ill and, and um, knowing that this varies every day and this can vary by team, um, but that we have the opportunity to be transparent with each other and say, you know what, I'm really in the orange today. And so I need you to watch out for me a little bit. And, and if you, and, and hold me accountable, if you see my behavior slipping a little bit, if you see me being a little bit short, um, hold me accountable to that. And, and, you know, I'm going to make a commitment that I'm going to go home and get extra sleep tonight to try to move myself back to the yellow or, or back to the green. Um, but so I like this model so, because it gives a little bit of a common language. <clears throat> so we're just going to briefly go through how our faculty are doing at an overall level. This isn't Department of Medicine specific data, but um, as many of, of you know, we did the coping with COVID um, caregiver survey through the American Medical Association. We did this uh, between July 13th and August 17th. So I, just keep in mind that that was sort of a little lull in COVID. We got a 25% response rate, which is you know reasonable for an internal well-being survey. And we looked at well-being measures, COVID specific measures, um, what resources we have and what resources people are using, and then organizational culture and climate. And just at a very high level, what we found is that the five main themes that were identified are isolation. So a great number of our faculty, half, are feeling very isolated. Um, there's opportunities around communication and transparency. People want to know how many people are sick, um, how many tests are we doing, when are the vaccines going to be available, how many are we going to get, what order is it going to go in. People have a lot of questions and making sure that we're really clear and transparent in those communications help uh, reduce some of that anxiety. Um, there's a lot of stress from caregiver issues, both caring for children, homeschooling, I have a kiddo doing homeschool now, and elder care and trying to balance that. And we're, and we're so lucky to have the support from the School of Medicine with the care.com um, process there, but but this was definitely a stress that people brought up. And then the importance of appreciation. They need to hear from each other, from the community, from their families, from their leaders, from the hospital, that what they do matters and that the sacrifice that they're making, the stress that they're under matters, and they're making a difference for the community around them. And then it was really loudly heard that behavioral health support services were needed. And we'll go through that just briefly. Um, but what I want to call out here in this slide is if you look at, so we have our overall data, um, we have our physician only data, our APPs and our researchers, and then in the circles are the benchmark data from the AMA. And you'll see our work overload is high. There was concern over family and child care concern. Our burnout rates were about on par with the AMA for our physicians, but much higher for our APPs. Um, and so that was definitely a vulnerable population that we identified. Overall, looking at retention data, if you look at who is considering reducing clinical hours in the next 12 months, about a quarter are in the sort of high range of giving that 
some consideration, uh, definite, likely, or moderate, and considering leaving practice in the next two years, again, about a quarter. And that goes back to, if you remember at the beginning, we were talking about retention data associated with burnout. So this is that sort of being worn out and people thinking about that. And then specifically looking at our mental health data. So we have about a third of our providers um, experiencing anxiety and depression self-reported. This is the second question of the PHQ-2. And I've included feeling down, depressed, or hopeless because it's actually most predictive of a suicide attempt because of that hopeless piece. These are our suicide ideation rates. So you can see 4% was um, for our physicians, 7% for our researchers, but we had a very low number of researchers. Um, so we do need to resurvey our researchers specifically. Um, but what I will say is there was a Medscape report that was done at the beginning of 2020, uh, which found about a 2% suicide ideation for physicians. So we were about double that, but, but nowhere near what our medical students were. And, and I, I would like to point that out. Um, about a quarter of our providers experiencing some sleep disturbance. And then here you can see that isolation that we were talking about. And when we look at how this is by uh, our vulnerable populations, you can see that our women are experiencing higher rates of stress, anxiety and depression, work overload, concerns about childcare, they feel less valued. Um, they're less likely to reduce their clinical hours, but slightly more likely to leave. And we have a 17% overall gap in burnout between men and women. And when you just look at um, uh, male and female physicians, there's an 18% gap there. Um, feeling down, depressed, or hopeless is about the same, um, but 10% are concerned over how they've been treated based on their gender, and then the isolation is about the same. And I just want to point out that those that didn't, didn't want to answer what their gender was um, are performing much more poorly across the board on all of these metrics. So if we then look at our URAM data, and we have the definition up there just to remind you, um, our URAM, and, and there, I, I do wanna say there is some um, data coming out and some questioning about whether burnout is a sensitive um, question in our URAM population. And so this is something that needs to be looked into more um, in the future. So, so take this data with that caveat. Um, but our, our URAM faculty are, pretty on par with our non-URAM faculty for stress, slightly more anxi anxiety or depression self-reported, less work overload, but significantly higher, well, concern over childcare, I shouldn't say, say significantly because we didn't do the stats on it, but, but higher concern over childcare, um, higher perception of feeling valued and less likely to reduce clinical hours or leave, um, a higher rate of burnout slightly, um, a higher rate of feeling down, depressed, or hopeless, slightly higher rate of suicide ideation, and then about 20% concerned over how they've been treated based on their race in the past 30 days, 14% concerned on how they've been treated based on their gender, um, and then the same rates of, of isolation. And then I just point out the same phenomenon. Again, those that decline to answer um, their ethnicity uh, are performing more poorly across the board. And so what are we doing about this? We'll, we'll start by talking about what we're doing at the medical school level. And, and Dr. Del Pino Jones, I'll turn it over to you if I can mute. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Um, so this particular chart lists a number of different personal strategies that can be used to promote well-being for both medical students and residents. And when we talk about state specific strategies, um, one thing that we have um, noticed with medical students is, you know, if they all have another job and are trying to supplement their income or um, if they're employed during medical school, this can definitely have a big effect on well being and burnout. Um, for residents, you know, the one thing that we want to highlight is the importance of really handing over all patient care. Um, it, all patient care needs at the end of a shift, um, just to avoid overextending oneself and having basically the work that we do um, sort of trickle into our personal life as well. And I would say this is also important for our faculty members as well. When we think of strategies for all stages, um, it can include things such as just trying to maintain a positive outlook, finding meaning in the work that we do. And a lot of people will find this through education, um, through volunteering and working in the community. Um, and additionally, of course, finding time to sleep and to exercise. Um, uh, next slide. And while I did, you know, um, while we are talking a bit about these personal strategies, I think it's always important to take a step back and say, what can we be doing um, in terms of the culture of medicine um, as a school, as a university, um, to promote wellness and well-being for our medical students, residents, and faculty? Um, you know, we always say that people can use all of these personal strategies, um, they can be very resilient, but if you put them in a 
an environment that is, um, you know, for lack of a better term, very toxic, it's hard for anybody to thrive in those sort of environments. So, um, you know, here are a couple examples of what we are doing to promote med medical student um, wellness and well-being. This by means, all means is not all inclusive um, and just highlights a few of the things that we are doing. So when we think about wellness curriculum, um, this has certainly been integrated into the medical school curriculum itself through what we call our threads. Um, so it's sort of these um, long longitudinal um, learning opportunities that we have for all of our students. And then some of you may be familiar with the advisory college program in which students are broken up in two different cohorts, um, sort of like Harry Potter is the example a lot of people use. But in these smaller cohorts, uh, students have access to faculty mentors as well as um, fourth year student advisors and mentors as well. And they can get career advice, um, advice and mentorship in terms of things that might be going on in their personal life as well. And um, through the ACP, we have required meetings with students, which allows us to really assess, you know, how are students doing? Um, so they may not come to a faculty member saying that they are struggling or um, not doing as well as they hoped, but through these meetings, we are sometimes able to catch um, the students who may not be doing as well. And during the time of COVID, um, we, they did institute ACP families in which um, there are virtual check-ins with the students just to see how they're doing. In terms of educational strategies, a lot of the work that we are, um, a lot of the things that have already been done or we are doing currently, as well as the things we are planning on doing as part of curriculum reform have been shown to promote wellness among students. So studies have shown that switching to a path to pass fail grading during the first and second year of medical school can help reduce competitiveness and increase collaboration and wellness amongst students. Additionally, having smaller, smaller learning communities, such as um, something called, we have like PBL groups or problem-based learning um, can also be helpful. And then um, longitudinal integrated curricula can also um, promote wellness in terms of students being in a, a smaller learning community, really getting to know the faculty and the students that they're working with, as well as their patient panel. Um, we've also integrated um, service learning more into the curriculum as a, as a way of promoting um, fulfillment in the work that we're doing. And as far as social activities, again, there are a number of events that are sponsored by the advisory college program and then having access, um, basically free membership to the health and wellness center can also be helpful in terms of promoting well-being. Next slide. So um, when we look at these same categories at the residency level, um, we have been able to integrate some curricula into um, Wednesday education sessions, um, as well as noon conferences where appropriate. And um, when we look at the educational strategies that we're using, you know, we had a change in the scheduling for our residents um, several years ago in which we switched to the four plus four scheduling. Um, so you may be familiar with the um, four weeks in the inpatient setting, four weeks in the outpatient setting. And the nice thing about this scheduling it is, is, it, is that it allows for at least um, four weekends that you know you will have off in your outpatient month. Um, it also allows for continuity with your patient panel, which again, a lot of residents have said has made their work more fulfilling and um, allow them to form more long lasting relationships with their patients. And then um, as always, there's a number of social activities that are spearheaded by the residents themselves, as well as through the multiple committees um, through the residency. Next slide. And then when we look at wellness in general, there are a number of things um, that are, have been implemented to promote this. And I did speak a bit about, um, you know, experience um, students and residents who experience microaggressions, any sort of discrimination and such you know, making sure that we truly promote a culture of no tolerance of harassment is important in terms of the well-being of our residents and our medical students, as well as our faculty. And knowing who to report to in those um, circumstances is also important um, in terms of the Office of Professional Excellence and Office of Equity. Um, we also have a number of faculty development sessions um, in regards to upstander training and making sure people feel com comfortable calling out microaggressions, bias, discrimination in real time, and that our learners feel, truly feel supported in those situations. 
We have a number of screening tools that are implemented by our, I'd say, governing agencies. Um, you know, we're able to use those, screen, those um, screening tools when we meet with students one-on-one, -on -one, and um, our residents are able to fill out um, surveys themselves as well, just to try to gauge where they are on burnout scales. Then, of course, having access to mental health care is important for both medical students and residents. Um, you know, for the residents, they do have one appointment that is scheduled for them when they start their internship, and they have the option of opting out of it if they feel like they're doing okay. But again, having that open door can be helpful to a lot of individuals. Next slide. So similarly for the faculty, there's um, quite a few resources from the School of Medicine and specifically um, from the School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. So there's um, a well-being support line and the numbers there. There's COVID-19 support groups. There's been over 500 of these and they've been uh, very highly regarded. Um, and there's a specific support group for clinicians as well as for researchers, as well as for learners. Um, there's the faculty and staff mental health clinic, um, which opened this summer and the phone number is there, um, which is confidential, covered by insurance, um, except if you have the Kaiser and, and then they'll work with you to figure out the best choices. Um, we talked about the student and resident mental health clinic. And then the Department of Psychiatry has um, this practical mindfulness strategies um, part of their website. And then they have this great podcast, which I would highly recommend called We Are Unstoppable. Um, and then the school in general um, has resiliency programs and peer support programs run by the Office of Professional Excellence. Um, so if you contact uh, Jeff Druck or Abby Laura, they can give you more information about that. Um, again, the faculty and staff mental health care and uh, mental health clinic. And then we talked about the care.com dependent care support. We have several employee assistance lines. Um, the Real Help hotline is sort of an emergent uh, phone number, as is the Colorado Crisis Center. Um, as is, and then the Phoenix Center is for interprofessional, interpersonal violence. Um, and then I want you all to know that we formed sort of collaboratively between the School of Medicine and um, the University of Colorado Hospital, the faculty and engagement faculty engagement will be in committee. So there is uh, one physician representative and one APP representative. Ideally, we're still working on every department from every department. We meet monthly. Um, th this is the group that helped put out the survey um, that helped um, create sort of our strategic planning for the year um, around what we were going to do at UC Health. Um, and so for the Department of Medicine, Katie Morrison and Katie Dickerman are your well-being champions. And so and, and they've done incredible work also in the Department of Medicine, um, but then can also share the work and learn from other departments in this committee. And just so you know, the governance structure here. So this committee actually reports directly to the senior management group of the University of Colorado Hospital. There's a parallel employee and staff well-being committee. And then we have a UC Health Engagement and Wellbeing Working Group, uh, which worked collaboratively uh, with the Faculty Engagement and Wellbeing Committee to make the well-being model that I'll show you in a second. Um, so this is our official well-being framework from the University of, uh, from UC Health, actually all the way across. And again, a ton of input from the Faculty Engagement and Wellbeing Committee and then the UC Health Wellbeing Committee. And um, just a couple things to note, um, really important to pull out organizational well-being from personal well-being so that there's sort of that institutional responsibility. Um, looking at that climate of well-being, how do we create a climate with zero tolerance uh, for microaggressions, upstander training? Um, how do we contribute to the community well-being, so the community around us? And then how do we offer behavioral health support? I also just want to share that the UC Health Virtual Behavioral Health Center is open 24-7 and is also available to all of us faculty, staff alike. You don't even have to work on the Anschutz campus to be able to call them. So that's an option as well. And, and just to say, there's a lot of content being built that's both um, a new communication model, a lot of team facing content, uh, particularly around upstander certification, just culture, um, and then a lot of uh, team facing, but for our patient content around unconscious bias, emotional intelligence, trust. So all of that'll be rolling out sort of early next year. Um, and then we've started our caring for our own support sessions. And so these will be offered every two weeks. Um, and so this is, you know, the stress of caring for our own during this time. So inevitably people that we know uh, will end up with COVID and will end up admitted um, to our hospitals. And, and so for us to be able to um, debrief a little bit about the experience of caring for our own. And so this is just the URL or the link to sign up for that. Um, and so the final sort of take homes are to look out for one another, um, get a buddy, check in with each other, try to hold each other accountable, um, get a sense of what each other's uh, red zone or orange zone looks like and how to hold each other accountable for um, health promoting behaviors that gets you out of that. 
Um, and to remember that we have groups that are particularly high risk. So our learners, our women, and our URAM are particularly high risk around uh, well-being issues. And so we need to be attentive to that. And the other thing that I've just been sharing with people is, you know, make the assumption, given our data, that when you interact with someone, they may be having a hard time and they may be going through a lot that you're unaware of. So give each other grace and approach each other with kindness um, and gentleness because everybody's going through a lot right now. And then the final plug is just ask for help before you need, think you need it. So don't wait until you're in the red. We have a lot of resources for help. If you start moving into the yellow or the orange, ask for help. And that's it. That was a terrific presentation, uh, really very timely and important uh, as we consider all the stress that everyone is undergoing. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, so let's start with um, how physical fatigue as opposed to emotional fatigue affects well-being and burnout. Amir, do you want to go or? Sure. Um, you know, when I think of physical <coughs> Um, you know, physical, physical fatigue prevents us from doing the activities that we would usually do, I would say, that would promote well, wellness and well-being. Um, so if you just don't even have the energy or the ability to um, work out or access to working out, um, to do the things that, you know, volunteer in the community and things like that, that in itself, it's just like a cycle that kind of feeds on itself. Um, so having that, you know, that physical fatigue can certainly feed into the, the mental fatigue that we see with a lot of our providers as well. And to, just to piggyback on that, Stanford did, um, has uh, done an evaluation at multiple institutions across the country, and sleep-related impairment is one of the largest drivers of burnout. And so I just want to really stress the importance of sleep. Um, and, and Laura McGladry gives a talk that's on the... Um, the podcast on the Department of Psychiatry's website. But, you know, one of the things she talks about is if you were on a deployment, you would go to work, come home, maybe exercise and go to sleep. And many of us are going to work, come home, teach your kid, clean the house, it's like doing all the other stuff that we can no longer do, you know, that we don't have support systems for anymore. So um, I think that physical fatigue piece is huge. And so really stressing, uh, just keeping it simple and sleep, sleep, sleep is so important. And we're actually forming a sleep task force um, of sort of experts on campus to try to address that. So there are a number of embedded characteristics uh, within our uh, profession uh, that, um, that are probably contributing uh, to burnout and um, and our um, overall state of well-being. Um, characteristics like competitiveness or um, um, lack of acceptance of any mistakes, um, uh, perfection in terms of what we do. Um, how are those issues being addressed uh, at the training level and also um, in the provider level, in the established clinician level, um, in terms of dealing with those issues that make uh, make it okay to um, uh, not be the very best in, in the class and uh, still be uh, accepted and still be supported <coughs> for the learning and how we're developing. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I'll say there for a long time, there was a, hypo a hypothesis about this sort of neurotic temperament that is attracted to medicine. Um, Chantel Williams actually did a really nice study looking at medical students and comparing their resilience on entering uh, medical school um, and then their third year at the end of their third year. Um, and the medical students were actually more resilient than the general population when entering medical school and less resilient by the end of their third year. Um, so I think it's important to look at what is the process of that sort of depersonalization that happens during our training. Um, and there's been several studies sort of looking at um, the new LIC model and things like that. Do, you know, do those um, hold a higher level of empathy or preserve that level of empathy through the training? And, and I think there's some preliminary data that it does. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, Stanford looked at this in the data they collected, but lack of self-compassion is one of the largest drivers of burnout, um, particularly for women. Um, and some of that is just, are you kinder to your peers about making a mistake or about being overextended than you are to yourself in your own mind? And so I think watching that self-talk and approaching yourself with the same sort of grace and gentleness that we give each other um, is really important. Uh, Kristen Neff does a lot of great work around self-compassion. She has a good book if people are interested. Mira, I'll turn it over to you. 
Yeah, no, that's that's great. I was actually going to say something very similar, just in terms of, you know, even starting at the medical school, medical student level, you know, we talk a lot about humanism in medicine and, um, you know, how we need to con connect with our patients on a humanistic level. Um, we need to do the same with each other and remember that we are human. Um, we will make mistakes. It's not, will we, we, we will. And having that ability to um, have that compassion for ourselves, just like we would for anybody else who might make a mistake or struggle. Um, we need to like intentionally do that and, um, you know, talk about those things and educate ourselves about those things. And that, is that being embedded in the curriculum in any, um, in any meaningful way to help <laughs> individuals um, be more compassionate in terms of their own um, accomplishments? Definitely. Um, you know, I can say I've personally been involved in a number of small group sessions that take place through the medical school, um, whether it be part of our, you know, um, we had our integrated clinicians course. We, as I said, we have our threads in which there are a number of small groups that take place in terms of humanities, ethics, and such. Um, and a lot of those conversations do involve um, self-care, taking care of each other, um, and not just the patient. And, and for the faculty, we're, we're revamping the communication course, which we will, we postpone the launch because of the second surge, but we will hopefully launch um, in, in uh, January, February, March of this coming year. We'll see what happens. But, um, and we do have, so the whole theme of that communication course is empathetic communication and how do you bring in um, not only empathy for others and sort of self-awareness around what you're bringing to the table, but then uh, empathy for yourself. And, and that's sort of where that stress continuum comes in. If you can identify where you are on that and, and then your peers can be vulnerable and share where they are. It also gives that normalization that we're human and that we're going to have orange and crispy orange and even red days. And then how do we help each other through that? So Dr. Harry, I was particularly interested in those trends that you uh, presented um, over the course of medical school, I believe that um, that peaked after one, after the first year and, and the third year uh, in terms of burnout. Um, I guess the question that I have is uh, were they, was, is that different by race or uh, by sexual orientation? So I actually don't know that data. Um, Amira put, put that study in. I think it was oh, great, sorry. So I, but I haven't read that study. So Amira, I would love you to teach us on it. Yeah, that was a great study. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly with that particular study, um, I don't know that they broke it down in, you know, by race and ethnicity to say, are there differences? It was looking at the general trend for our medical students and the, basically the commonalities that may be occurring during those times. Um, so it, as I had mentioned, I think at, at one point there's that transitional point, right, where we start medical school and it's just different, right? Learning is different. The workload is different. Um, our ability to, you know, um, connect with family and friends may be reduced. So it's not surprising that we see that sort of peak in terms of um, depersonalization, emotional exhaustion um, after year one. And then um, sort of similarly for after year three, it's, it's yet that other transition. You know, we often joke about, you know, as soon as you get comfortable doing something, so you get comfortable with the sort of classroom work with the traditional training that, that we have. Um, now you move to a different setting where you're kind of relearning and applying things in a very different way. Um, again, you may have your first experience with a patient dying, um, see things that you just haven't seen before. Um, hence seeing that peak once again in emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. So um, at the, in the patient care setting, we function in a very complex team. Uh, team that uh, usually involves learners and providers at different levels and, um, and nurses, respiratory therapists, and uh, a number of other individuals. What, uh, and each, uh, I would imagine that our, our individual well-being or our sense of burnout being done for interprofessional well-being as uh, a group of providers that we want to deliver the absolute best care we can uh, to the patient that uh, many of these individuals are interacting 
uh, on uh, that um, are trying to uh, focus on a specific patient. Um, the interprofessional aspects of it must be difficult to deal with. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's an excellent point. And I know there's a lot going on at the medical school and, and Amir, I'd love to hear it. it. You know, at the faculty level at the University of Colorado Hospital specifically, um, that's part of why we're revamping the communication curriculum. So we had our nurses getting trained in one communication methodology. We had our administrative leaders getting trained in, in a different one. Um, and, and then we had our faculty getting trained in yet a third. And, and believe it or not, there were several others as well. And so you have an incident with a patient where maybe you have to do service recovery and you have all these people come to the bedside with different skills and they're not speaking the same language. And so we're really working on building a common culture. And what does that common culture look like? And what are the expectations of behavior across everybody um, when you walk the halls and, and really sort of normalizing um, that? So that'll be in the communication course. And we are standardizing that across all parts of the care team. Um, and then parts of that is like the upstander bystander training, which uh, will roll out um, to the providers in January, um, but has started rolling out um, and several other of sort of the climate um, initiatives that are going to be um, rolled out regardless of role type, really trying to enhance that. But one thing I would encourage teams to do is um, share what color you are in the morning and, and just sort of get that out there so that everybody can and you can track it over time and, and people even sort of put post-its up on their on the wall and of how the team is doing over time but that really um helps break down the barriers and sort of normalize that experience together but amira i'll turn it over to you um yeah you know I think as far as the communications in the school of medicine we've got our interprofessional education um curriculum where medical students get to work with other students in the other professional schools um go through cases and communicate about different approaches and i think that through that, they're able to understand each other's perspectives and how each may view a patient encounter, which I think can be helpful once they get to that clinical setting. And then I would say in general, um, I think it's becoming more common when things do not go well in the hospital, just having a debrief with all of the, the people involved, um, you know, from the nurses to the RTs, um, to anybody who may have been impacted by that particular event. And I think it's, it's good to reflect on that and see, you know, from a communication standpoint, could things have gone better? Um, you know, why was somebody feeling the way they were or communicating the way they were? Um, you know, sometimes you just have to take a step back and um, reflect on things that are occurring and ask, you know, you know, why, why is this happening the way it is? Why is the communication maybe not as good as I had hoped between myself and, you know, a different team member? So there are a lot more questions and I just do, I want to ask one final question because it is important. Um, there's a big gap between burnout and um, suicide ideation and the, and, and the access or utilization of mental health uh, services. Um, two part question, what can we do to improve um, utilization of mental health services. Um, how can we make that more acceptable among our peers um, and colleagues? And, and two, does nomenclature get in the way? In other words, should we begin to label burnout as depression and help people move to a situation where they're uh, seeking attention for a medical problem that uh, needs, uh, needs where they need help? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an excellent question, and we and we definitely saw that in the data from the AMA survey. I think um, the first issue is destigmatization, and so and that's a twofold issue. So one, it's the culture, and we asked people, "What are you doing instead? How are you seeking mental health care?" And most people said they prefer to handle issues themselves, uh, or they would talk with fr friends and family or reflect on items that they're grateful for. Um, and I think that that idea of sort of handling things ourselves or white knuckling through it is a very classic. Um, temperament for, for providers and for um, those in our field. And, and so I think learning to say, I need help and making that a normal part of our, our community and also just sort of um, making it as benign as getting a trainer if you wanted to learn how to you know get stronger or be competitive at swimming or whatever. So I think that piece is important. Also clarifying misconceptions. There's a lot of misconceptions out there around what is the impact on my licensure? Am I going to lose my ability to practice? Um, is CPHP no longer confidential, et cetera? So I, I know Dr. Schwartz, um, you know, you guys have done a ton of work on trying to clarify some of those misconceptions by having CPHP come talk at the town hall, et cetera. 
Um, but I think continuing to do that work around clarifying some of the misconceptions. Um, and it's interesting, the question between depression and burnout. So they've actually looked at this, and I think Tate Chanafield's about to um, have this uh, study published, but depression and anxiety are going up during the pandemic, not burnout. So burnout is staying about stable. So if you look at even our burnout numbers, they're pretty stable. We didn't measure burnout like that here before, but pretty stable to what the national averages were before. But it's the depression and anxiety numbers that are going up. Um, and so I think also it's it's important to draw a distinction between those two because depression and anxiety are clinical issues, just like hypertension and diabetes that need clinical treatment. Uh, whereas burnout, we can use a lot more health promoting behavior or sort of strategic initiatives um, from or the organization. Amir, what are your? Um, I think you summed it up very nicely. I was going to say the same thing, just in terms of removing that stigma, making sure um, you, our clinicians know about access to the different resources and have an understanding of um, what will happen with that information once they do seek help and um, access those different things. Right. Well, we've gone beyond the hour. Uh, we probably have a lot more to talk about. Uh, maybe we'll invite you back for another uh, Medical Grand Rounds. This was a terrific discussion. Thanks, Dr. Delpino-Jones and Dr. Harry. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.